you have your Bibles, we're still in Deuteronomy and we are in chapter 22. That's what we're diving into today. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. There is a common misunderstanding that the more you know something, especially in the religious world, specifically our faith, the more you pursue knowledge and doctrine and the attributes of God and the character of God, the colder you're going to get. And, and the less passionate you're going to be. If that is the case for any person, that the more you study about God and hear about God, the colder you're getting, we have to really stop and examine where we're at and why we're pursuing the knowledge of God. Because the result of such a pursuit will produce greater passion. And it will show in many different ways. And one of those ways is going to show is in how we talk to him and how we sing to him and how we talk to others about him as well. The pursuit of the knowledge of God. Deuteronomy 22, we're going to be talking about the first 12 verses. If you were here last week, we talked about what we can call maybe strange concepts. Strange to our culture, strange to our immediate context. But nevertheless, it's in the Bible. And the pursuit of the knowledge of God, guess what? It's not just in the New Testament. Two-thirds of our Bible is Old Testament. And it is kept there by the Holy Spirit for a reason. So we better discover why it's there. And if there's one thing we're going to learn about these commands that we're about to find out about is something concerning the nature and character of God. That is always the case. But we are still in that realm of perhaps foreign concepts in Deuteronomy. So last time we gave snapshots of the subjects that we're going to talk about. Here's the snapshots for this chapter, at least the first half of it. Number one, what do you do when your brother loses his possessions? Number two, cross-dressing. Number three, how to treat birds. Number four, how to build your house. Number five, what not to mix. Everything from seed to animals working together to the material of your clothing and what you should wear. This is what we're going to be talking about. And we have to wonder, what does this say to us? Well, all scriptures breathe out by God for our instruction, for reproof, for correction, for teaching and righteousness that the man of God may be complete. So this is something for us. Deuteronomy 22 beginning in verse 1. God here in this chapter is highlighting commands that would reinforce community and mutual responsibility. Everything about this chapter is how a society should work in terms of the old covenant with the people of Israel. These are not laws that are binding to us in this day, especially in the new covenant. But in this particular context, commands that would promote a harmonious society on a day-to-day -day basis. So these are very detailed commands, but each of these detailed commands, if they were to be honored, would have a larger scale impact on how the nation would function according to God's desired will. And the first thing that we notice here is how someone is to respond if he finds a missing property that belonged to another Israelite. And so let's just read. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. And if he does not live near you and you do not know who he is, you shall bring it home to your house and it shall stay with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. You shall do the same with his donkey or with his garment or with any lost thing of your brother's. Which he loses and you find you may not ignore it. You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore them. You shall help him to lift them up again. Bible study, two questions. Or one question, two answers. What two words do you see in these verses repeat themselves? One repeats himself more than the other. What's the one word that sticks out in these few verses? You got it. Brother. You lift it first, but then you said it aloud. Yes, brother. Five times is the word brother mentioned. That's important. Why? Because he wants them to relate to each other in such a way. You're not just my neighbor. You're not just a fellow citizen. You're not just an Israelite. You're my brother. Here's the rule. We said it last week. If you're going to come into relationship with God, you automatically come into relationship with his people. 
You can't separate the two. This concept, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church, is wrong. Well, I'm a Christian, I walk with Jesus, I don't, know, I don't need to walk with other people that walk with Jesus, is completely false. It is foreign to the Old Testament. It is definitely foreign to the New Testament. When you say yes to Jesus, I follow him, you automatically not just bind yourself to his heart, you bind yourself arm in arm with other brothers and sisters who also have bound their hearts to his. Brother, 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 brother. And the second word, anybody can guess, that repeats itself? Ignore. Ignore. Three times is the word ignore brought up. And here's the idea. The temptation for an Israelite to see a missing ox that belonged to a brother or a garment or whatever it may be, what's the temptation? To ignore it. I'm going to pretend that I didn't see the ox. I'm going to pretend I didn't see the donkey. I'm going to pretend I didn't see his coat. Why? Because to take upon the responsibility of bringing it into your home will cost something to a certain degree. It will cost time. It will cost energy. It will cost personal resources. Because, for example, if you were to bring in a donkey, who knows how long before your neighbor comes to your house or the person that lost it comes to your house. You have to feed the thing. You have to clean the thing. It's going to eat out of your own pocket. It's not something that's beneficial to the one who finds it. So the temptation is, I'm just going to pretend I didn't see it. Ignore. Now, we can apply this to ourselves and say that's true, you know, but... The New Testament has the same command about being responsible for one another, but a different emphasis. The emphasis is greater than your car. The emphasis is greater than your nice jacket or your wallet, as important as those things is. The, the being a brother's keeper for another in the New Testament, we can translate verse 1 of Deuteronomy to get the idea. So, so what does it say in verse 1? You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. Now let's, let's change it. I'm not changing the verse. I'm changing it to give you an idea of what the New Testament emphasizes. What does it say? You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them, right? Here's what the New Testament emphasizes. You shall not see your brother going astray and ignore him. You shall not see your sister going astray and ignore her. That's what the New Testament amplifies in terms of mutual responsibility amongst a covenant people. And the proof of that is in James chapter 5, verse 19. The end of the book of James, how this man, inspired by the Spirit, ends the book is by declaring a very similar theme. But not about what you own. It's about your soul. The most precious thing to you. As much as it's a personal thing, there is also a corporate responsibility. Look what it says here. My brothers... If anyone among you wanders from the truth, not your donkey, not your ox, not your garment, or anything else. If you, if you, 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 if you wander away from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner, ouch, brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So let's go back to verse 19 and, and let's examine that verse. My brothers, is he talking to uh, the world? Is he saying, my brothers, if anyone among you who professes to be a Christian but really they're not a Christian? He doesn't say that. He says, my brothers, if anyone among you speaking to the Christian community, em emphasizing the importance but also highlighting the possibility that a person within the Christian community can wander away from his or her gospel convictions and gospel practices. In a practical sense. If anybody wanders, and that word denotes not just like a crisis moment that would have them isolate themselves, though that's possible. The idea is a slow drifting away. We've all seen it, haven't we? The slow drifting away. We begin to see a change in behavior of the speech, of their passion. It's lacking. Then we see a slow drifting away of attendance. A slow drifting away from the people of God, from the community of faith. And a greater embracing of the world. And, and now it's not even difficult to find out. All you need to go is go on the person's Instagram and see it. The person's Facebook can see it. There's a wandering away that comes. And this is a powerful thing. He gives this command because the temptation for the Christian is the same temptation for the Israelite. To ignore it. Why? 
for the same reason. It's going to cost me time. And do you know, it takes energy to pray for somebody that's wandering away. It takes energy. One of the most tiring and taxing things in the Christian life, I believe, is intercession. If you've ever done it, if you've come on a Wednesday night, you, you can know there's something tiring about praying on behalf of others. It's, it's, it's a battle. Resources. Man, this person wandering, and I have to drive out and see them out of my time, out of my... I, I got to do so much, and now I got to go fetch them and see them face to face. Or even just ignoring it for the sake of not having to confront that person. That's probably the most awkward thing of it all. To, to confront somebody that's not vocalized. You know, people that wander away from the truth don't come up on the pulpit one day and say, hey guys, I'm wandering away from the truth. I'm no longer going to be a practical Christian. See you later. That doesn't happen. And oftentimes when you have to confront somebody that's wandering away, they'll be all defensive. What are you talking about? I'm fine. What are you talking about? I still love Jesus. Yeah, but your Instagram doesn't show it. Your Snapchat doesn't prove it. So the confrontation element of it is not, is not a pleasant experience. And so James, by the Spirit, is, is encouraging the believers that this concept of going out and grabbing those that have wandered away is a vital, hear it, ministry. <laughs> vital ministry. How vital? Look at the language that he gives about a believer that walks away. Look at verse 20 again. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now let's just be honest. If I were to read that without verse 19, I would think that this context is about evangelism. Right? I'm th verse 20, I'm thinking you're going out and preaching and saving souls. That's not what verse 20 is, though. You isolate it, that can be it. But verse 19 is connected to it. So this is about a brother. This is about a sister that's going out. And, and what's the idea here? Oh, we can spend the rest of the Bible study talking about the controversy of this verse. But we won't. The idea here is that the value in the eyesight of God, the importance of bringing back a lost sheep, he uses the same language as going out and grabbing a lost soul to bring them back to Christ. That's important to God. This is very, very strategic language to encourage the one that goes and bring back the lost brother. That this is a vital and crucial importance to God and for their own soul. This is a very, very important thing. And the idea is, listen, if you know somebody, here's the, here's the application. If you know somebody, the temptation will be to ignore it. But let me tell you something. A simple text message can go a long way. A simple message, a simple phone call can go a very long way for somebody that you know personally that has wandered away from the truth. And I know there's so many ideas that are coming up to mind because it's a case-by-case -case situation, right? Well, this person's ignoring me. Okay, that's fine. You do what you need to do. You do what you need to do. But realize this, that when that brother has wandered away, Satan is sending out evangelists to that person. The devil has her right where she wants her, right, right where he wants her. And what he will do is what we should do, and that's reach out to them to bring them back. Because you better believe this, he, he will send out recruiters and evangelists to make sure that they don't ever come back into the fold. So God says in Deuteronomy 22, don't ignore it. You being in this covenant with me means you're in covenant with other people. And so the temptation might be to turn the other cheek or the other way in terms of your sight. But no, take it upon yourself to be a loving brother, a loving sister, and bring back that wanderer. That's the main application of these first few verses. Then we jump into some random subject in verse 5. A woman shall not wear a man's garment. Nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. Here's a strong word. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Contrary to modern belief, the human race is comprised of two genders. Male and female. This is how God created mankind. Male male. And female, he created them, and it was a reflection of his own image upon his creation. The clear command here in Deuteronomy 22 
this is God's motivation behind it. His desire is to protect any influence that would attempt to blur the lines between the two sexes. The cross-dressing issue is an attempt. So if somebody attempts to go that route with this command prohibits, what, what's going on there is that that act is a step further into making no distinction between a man and a woman, and listen to this, is ultimately an assault on God's creative order. When a culture does not honor the uniqueness of the two distinct genders or tries to merge them and make them two interchangeable things, what you have is evidence of a catastrophic confusion on a foundational level in a society. Can I say that again? When a culture attempts to make no distinction between the unique elements of a man and a woman or attempts to merge or interchange them, what you have is catastrophic confusion at the foundational level of a society. Because if you confuse the concept of a simple thing as gender, what you do is open up an entire generation to be potentially confused in every other sphere of life. And that's what we're seeing today. I want you to know this that what we are witnessing and what seems to be escalating more and more through the transgender movement is no light thing. And don't crucify me for saying that. You have secular psychologists that are backing that statement up. But whether they do or do not, we have to understand the seriousness of it. And here's the reality. As believers, this is what we're faced with. We didn't ask for this. This seemed to just come out of nowhere. But it's our responsibility as a community not to bow to the culture, but to know how to respond to the culture with gospel. We, we can't afford to not have answers, even though there are new things coming up almost on a yearly basis. And this subject of blending genders or this, this spectrum of genders, all these things. Listen, this probably wouldn't have been an issue 100 years ago, but it is an issue today. And we have to deal with it. We do have to deal with it. And how we're going to deal with it in this Bible study... From Deuteronomy 22, never thought from Deuteronomy 22 we'd talk about such a modern issue, is maybe talk about maybe three questions that people might ask concerning the issue. What's the big deal about it? That's the first one. What's the big deal about transgenderism? I'll give you two sub points. Number one, this ideology, this movement, number one, is an assault on God is an assault on God. Whether people are realizing it or not, the movement that we are seeing today is energized by the devil himself. And the sole purpose is assaulting God as the author and creator of mankind. And here's just a small example of that. Let's say if you took a picture of me. And maybe you wanted to. Yeah, let me take a picture. Then you go out and you print an 8 and a half, 11 image of me and you grab a group of your friends, and one of them pulls out a cell phone, and with that image, you begin to throw it on the, the ground, you step on the image, you spit on the image, and you ultimately burn the image. Now, though I am not the direct object of that assault, the fact that it is being implemented upon the image that it represents is already sending me a message as the image holder. The fact that it's being done to the thing that is representing who I am speaks loudly of the fact that it is being done to me indirectly. And that's exactly what we're seeing with the human race. The fact that what God had created so clearly and so obviously and with an intended purpose and an initial purpose for all time, the fact that that's being trampled with is a message to the fact that we are created in the image of God that we are assaulting God himself. We bear his image. And when his image is trying to be morphed or shifted or mutilated, it's an assault on God himself. 
And that is a scary thing. Because when somebody, listen, when somebody embraces this concept, when, when they maybe struggle with it, but that struggle has become their identity and they are convinced that this is who they are, though their biology is saying something else, though, though their DNA is testifying of something else, whether people realize it or not, and maybe this is not their immediate thought, but this is what they're doing, especially when they go further into making changes to fit what they feel they should be. Listen to what happens. What that person is doing, whether they realize it or not, is testifying, God is not the creator of who I am. I'm my own creator. It doesn't matter how God made me to be. I know who I'm supposed to be. And so I'm going to make the changes necessary to make that message clear. I get to choose what I am. And it moves God completely out of the picture of being any source, or rather the source, of the influence of who you and I were meant to be in this world. Primarily, it is an assault on God. But secondly, it is an assault on man. It's an assault on, on the person itself. Transgenderism, and when a person undergoes any sexual rearrangement, whether on a surgical level or even on a chemical level, because there are different levels. You can take hormones to change yourself. You can go and do surgery if you can afford it to actually change genitalia and parts of your body to make you look like the opposite sex. Whatever way you go, listen, this is very scary. And secular psychologists won't say this. And let me tell you what secular psychologists are doing in a minute. It's a form of personal suicide. A very slow one, too. Because what, what that promotion is doing, it is literally removing a person from the reality of who they are and reality as we know it. It is pulling them away from basic understanding of their existence. At the ground level, at the foundational level. And so to promote that is ultimately a person removing themselves Further and further away of who they truly are. And studies have shown more and more. Are you ready for this? Secular studies have shown more and more that actually the greatest follow-up study and research of those who have undergone surgery to change themselves after a span of 10 to 15 years are 20 times more likely to kill themselves. Want the link? Just come and ask me after the Bible study. 20 times more likely to commit suicide after the fact that they have done all that they thought they can do to make themselves more into what they feel like they should be. And what happens? It doesn't work. You won't become more whole when you do that. It's contrary to the law of God. The further you go away from truth, even for yourself and who God calls you to be, the further you're going into Emptiness, vanity, despair. You can't change your biology. It is scary. I've watched even interviews on this. And, and I echo the YouTube comments. Sometimes I just go to the YouTube comments right away just to see what people say. And it, it, it's true. People, people are saying this obvious thing. I can't believe we're actually having to explain this today. The fact that we need to bring on professionals to explain the simplicity of gender distinction what makes a man a man? What makes a woman a woman? It's crazy. But that's what we're facing. And I know I'm coming off very, very strong. But it's not to strike such a person down. Because, you know, the reality is, in Deuteronomy 22, we don't get a reason why somebody would tr dress the opposite way that they were intended to dress. There's no motive behind it. We don't get the motive. All we know is this, that no matter what a person might feel, no matter what his motive is to, to, to promote that practice in their lives. This conclusion is never the final answer or an answer at all. So dismiss the motive to come to this point according to God is never, ever the answer. And you might genuinely have people, listen, who struggle with those internal emotions or those thoughts. They might feel displaced. They, they might feel as though, yes, there's a contradiction in their, their own body, 
That can be very true. And who are not thinking, oh, I'm going to assault God's character by pursuing this. Or thinking, oh, oh, yes, I, I want to be my own creator. There's genuine tension in their heart. That's very true. It could be possible. But this Deuteronomy 22 is never the answer for that. What is the hope for somebody who struggles with that? The same hope for any person that's struggling with anything contrary to the will of God in their lives. And it's the gospel. It's the gospel. Listen, the answer for a person that's struggling with themselves is simply this. You know who God is. And then you understand who God made you to be. And then you go from there to understand what the fall of man has done to us. And then you follow it up by understanding what the possibility of you becoming to be is through the gospel. That's it. What is the answer to somebody who might try to embrace themselves even though it's in contradiction to God? How do I embrace myself? Is that the answer? Is the answer to true identity embracing who I am? Mark 8, 34. Mark 8, 34 gives us the answer. How do I deal with the fact that my identity is being pursued? I want to know who I really am. I'll tell you this. It's not in embracing who you am. It's in denying who you are. And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself. Let me say it again. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Why? What's the result of denying myself? It's in verse 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. That's the answer. So when I remove myself from my own subjective understanding, this is who I am, and I'm not going to deny it. Whether you believe it or not, you're going to lose your life. And the further you go away with that truth in your mind, the more you realize you're losing yourself. The answer to true identity and discovering it is in denying yourself and then accepting who God says you are. That's the answer. And the devil will tell you otherwise. Deny myself, embrace who God says I am and who God says I'm able to be. And you know what? A person with such struggles needs that truth to be rehearsed. And let, guess what? That struggle might not go away completely. But listen, we all have our unique struggles with our bodies. And it might not be how you might feel like you're a different person or a different gender. But every single one of us can testify that this body is at war with us in one way or the other. And there's a gospel promise, not just for the person that struggles with the concept of transgenderism. In Romans 8, 23, Paul says something specific about redemption. Because when we hear salvation, we think about our souls. We think about the spirit man. We think about our position before Christ. But look what it says here. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. He's talking about how the creation is misplaced. How creation is groaning. How creation is seeking redemption. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirits, talking about being believers, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Of our bodies. Not just our souls, but the things you and I are tempted with. The things that make us sick physically. The things that might confuse us with our bodies. All of those things fit under this redemption. There is a day coming in which we will be adopted as sons. Well, I thought I'm already adopted as a son. Yes, you are. But there's a day coming where your body itself will be realigned, recalibrated, renewed in the redemption where you will be whole. And that tension, whether it's temptation, whether it's sickness, or whether it is confusion about your gender, will be healed. Completely. And so the hope for the person struggling with transgenderism is the hope for the person that's struggling with pornography. Or with lust. Or with sickness. Cancer. Whatever it may be. Look forward to the fact that one day your body will be redeemed and made whole again. That's the gospel truth. 
and we all hold on to that to some measure. And maybe that truth will be a greater truth and a greater savor to one who is struggling with their identity in terms of their biology. Here's another question. And we won't spend too much time on it, but it's in light of the believers. So as Christians, how do I talk to a transgender person? How do I talk to them? How do I identify with them? How do I, what do I say to them? How do I speak? How do I even communicate with an individual that has that, that is clearly displaying the fact that they are not, they're not running with what they've been given at birth, so to speak. I can ask this out loud and it will turn into something, I'm sure. But I'll say this briefly. There is a wisdom that we must operate in. A deep wisdom that we must operate in. But part of the strategy of this movement is to compromise. Is to compromise on any level to make sure that we are that much more accepting to what's going on around us. And so I know that there are different situations here. It could be a relative. It could be a teacher. It could be a coworker. But I will say this. For the sake of moving on in this Bible study, that this is going to be part of the price that we're going to pay in our generation as Christians. This is going to be part of the price that we're going to pay as Christians to make sure that as believers, especially in a way in which we are invited to, to embrace this ideology in a public form that would make it seem like we're accepting of it. And we have to make a stand for truth in a very compassionate and merciful and loving and wise way. There will be a price to pay. There will be a price to pay. Because our goal is to bring people out of delusion. And to bring them into greater clarity and light of what God ordained them to be. And the hope and the peace and the joy that is found in that. That's the goal. And so our goal is to never keep somebody in that place... For the sake of not offending. Nevertheless, we also want to be a people that don't unnecessarily offend. And approach perhaps an individual in such a way where we close off any opportunity to speak greater truth into their hearts. Does that make sense? So if somebody I know or somebody I meet presents himself that way, may God Almighty give you the wisdom in that moment. To know how to navigate a conversation. So that you would be invited to speak into their hearts. And even if you do so in such a way and that is closed off. This is, these are things out of our control. The reason why I'm not being very specific is because this is very circumstantial, isn't it? It's very circumstantial. If you have an individual that, ha that is a male and has a woman's name. Or a gender neutral name, which is possible. I know guys that have kind of names that are given to girls and I know girls that have kind of names that are given to guys but then it comes to the issue of pronouns that's I think where the real issue is when a, when a person's saying I'm a guy but call me she her etc etc that's where I think the real issue lies and it's very circumstantial but let me put it this way and I think I'm making myself clear this is a price that we're going to pay as believers in this generation Whew. Let's move on. Verse 6. So we go from cross-dressing to how to treat birds. Isn't that interesting? The Bible is never boring. Whoever says the Bible is boring, it's not true. Verse 6. If you come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground, so if you come across a bird's nest, we just talked about if you come across somebody who's dressing. If you come across... A bird's nest in any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs. You shall not take the mother with the young. You shall let the mother go, but the young you may take for yourself. Now, look at the promise associated with such a simple and small command. That it may go well with you and that you may live long. Wow. Now, that sounds familiar to the fifth commandment, saying, honor your father and your mother. I never knew that was associated with how I treat birds. 
Why is God so concerned about how we handle a creature, and not just any creature, but a creature as small as something that can fit in the palm of my hand? And not just that, a, a creature that is, is seen all around us. There's a multitude of them. Can I tell you why? Can anybody guess why? Think of the New Testament a little bit. I believe because it reflects the character of God. Because look what Matthew 6 says. If we put it up on the screen in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Who feeds them? Your heavenly Father. No, the, the old man that I see in the park, he feeds them. My neighbor that throws seeds on the, that, no, she feeds them. Your heavenly Father, in the midst of all the things, in the midst of sanctifying you, of protecting you, of guiding you, of answering prayers all across the world, you know what he's also doing? Feeding birds. <laughs> Feeding little birds. Think, well, that's nice. Well, it doesn't end there. Then you go to Matthew 10, 29, and look what it says. In Matthew 10, 29, the same book. Matthew 10, 29 tells us, are not two sparrows type of birds sold for a penny? He's saying two birds are worth a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. So he doesn't just take care of them while they live. He's in control and fully aware when they die. He attends their funeral services, so to speak. Birds! What's the point of all of this? If he cares about the birds, how much more are you? That's the whole lesson. I know it's simple. I know we've heard it, but feel it tonight. He feeds them. And not one of them, out of all the birds in your house, in your neighborhood, around your house, whatever it is, he makes sure that they're well taken care of and based on his authority, they die. Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Apart from his knowledge, apart from his keeping power. And then we think to ourselves, when we don't have answered prayer for a week, God doesn't care about me. And then this command here in Deuteronomy, the fact that there's attention given to birds, even in the Old Testament, says something about the heart of God. I actually care about them. I, I actually care about how you handle them. And part of the idea there of the fact of taking the eggs and letting the mother go, some would believe, is that to, to, not, to not bring more pain to the mother, this is just some argument, to letting the mother go and just taking what you need. But what's fascinating about this is that it's so small and it's to encourage an attitude of compassion towards smaller things, smaller lively things in this. Why? So that they would have in their hearts a growing compassion for the things, or rather the people that are created in the image of God. By stirring their hearts to give attention to birds, surely they would grow to have greater love and greater care and greater attention to human beings. And then you come to verse 7 with that promise that's tied into it. That it may go well with you and that you may live long. And here's the main principle behind this command. If you take the eggs with the mother, what you do is you cut off the possibility of that mother being able to produce even more eggs. Of that mother being able to create more resources, not just for you, but for other Israelites. And so this is to cut off any covetousness or selfishness, to take it all for themselves, including the mother that bore the eggs, and say, no, 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 let the mother go so that others can receive from her. And here's the application, because that's a very small act of obedience, isn't it? That's a very small detail in our, in our walk with obedience, right? Because the idea is, it's just one bird, let me just take the mom with it. <laughs> but that, the problem is, if everybody does that, then there's going to be no further fruit, no further benefit for the rest. And so here's why this is given. It's, it's a broader principle, small acts of obedience have greater and longer lasting effects. What God is saying here is if you let that mother go, it will produce further blessings for others. If you choose to keep that mother for yourself with the eggs, you cut off possibility for others from receiving. And the, the temptation here was not to trust that and to dismiss the smaller command 
And what God's trying to teach his people, especially us, is the fact that he ties in such a big promise is to say this. Don't ever ignore the small things in the Bible. Don't ever ignore the small commands in the scripture and deal with the big ones only. Jesus himself said to the Pharisees that you embrace the smaller commands by rejecting the greater ones. And what he was saying was, embrace the greater ones while not neglecting the smaller ones. See, we have the opposite idea. We say, let's embrace the bigger ones. And nah, these ones are insignificant. And from Deuteronomy 22, I see something. Don't ignore the small things because they have big blessings. And they can produce great, 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 great reward. That's why this promise is tied into such an insignificant instruction. Because he wants to give to them this understanding. Small command, big command, they're all commands. Disobey any one of them, consequences. Obey all of them, blessings. So this is what we learn from the birds. And then we go from birds to how to build your house. What does it say in verse 8? When you build a new house, when you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. So here's the instruction. You build the walls, you're going to have a roof, right? And it was common in that day that your roof would be a place of prayer. We see that with Peter, right? Didn't Peter go up to the roof and ask to pray while they were making him some food? It's a place of relaxation. It's a place of entertainment. It's a place of hosting guests. The roof. As you build your house, make sure that the walls go a little further up so that they will create a barrier around that roof. What's this command about? It's about everything that we see in this chapter to promote a mindset that all that you do, you don't do it with you and yourself in mind. You have other people in mind. And here it's the safety of your own family members and the safety of guests as they come over to your house. And so here's, here's the understanding. Physical protection. Lest there be an accident, somebody dies because they slip, because they trip, because they fell asleep and they roll over. And then you've got to run to the city of refuge and you have to go through all that process. Avoid the possibility by letting the walls go up a little higher and creating parameters, railings around your roof. And reading that, I go, that, that's great. That's some good advice. But what's the spiritual implication? I think there's a spiritual implication here. These are physical guidelines to promote a physical safety. And yet at the same time, believers, not just about your physical home, but spiritually for your home, you and I also must create parameters. We must create guides. We must create limits. Lest we put people's souls in danger, specifically the people that we call family. That's all over the New Testament. Listen, we know it. The world is dark and evil. And if there's going to be any safe haven in our society, it has to be the home of the saint. If there's going to be any place that there's going to be security for my inner man, Never mind my, my body not falling over a roof. It's those who are, who are governing a home and a family to be discerning and prayerful enough that whatever they let in, they know what they're letting in. Whatever they let stay, they know what they're going to let stay. And whatever they need to kick out, they know what they need to kick out in order to promote a greater security for my soul, for your children's souls. That is a responsibility. Because Satan will attack the home. And guess what? It is not limited. As we, where, where did all our minds just go? Ungodly entertainment, right? Don't watch this. Don't watch that. It goes way further than that. What else do I let into my home? Do I, do I let in and do I allow unforgiveness to stay in my home? Do I allow and let in fear in my home? Do I let in and allow foul speech do i let in and allow lack of love and compassion in my home anything that would reign in the household that would put my soul in danger or put other souls in danger this is what we get from this command in deuteronomy that your abode should make sure 
that souls can be kept safe and grow safely from the influences that are outside. But maybe you don't have a home. Maybe you don't, you're not a father. Maybe you're not a husband. The home speaks of something else. The home, inviting somebody, if I were to invite you to my house, I'm inviting you closer into my personal space. There's something about my home that speaks about who I am. And there's something about letting somebody into my home that invites them to come nearer into who I am as an individual, correct? Right? There's a difference if you and I go out to a restaurant and hang out and talk, and you and I going into my living room and talking, right? And this is what I pull out of this too, that if I were to invite you closer to my life, would you be safer or would you be more in danger? I'm talking about your soul. I'm not talking about the physical. I'm talking about your spiritual state. If I were to invite you closer into my life, would your spiritual state be safe or would it be in greater danger from falling? The, the warning here is that nobody would fall and that there would be blood guilt on your house. And here's the danger for all of us. That we would be invited into somebody's life and get closer to them and put ourselves in danger of falling. Or that we would be the reason why somebody might fall. You'd be amazed to know how many people have come to the conclusion, I just can't stay close to you because the closer I get to you, the further I get away from God. But you know who I want to be in this life? I want to be a person that whoever comes into my life, they can make sure and they can be assured that I would not open themselves to anything that would make them fall. That they would be safe and sound by God's grace. You and I have to create that mentality and to walk with Jesus in such a way that when people come close to us, they get closer to Jesus. Right? Don't you want that? I hope so. I wonder how many, man, I'm, I'm holding myself back from going this direction. Because every time I come, because I cannot tell you how many Christian casualties there are from hanging out with so-called Christians long enough for them to be in the world. I'm telling you. Everything from spiritual leaders to worship teams that have opened their lives up to other people and have dragged them down into the world. Yeah, you would be surprised. Now we come after to this next issue, verse 9. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest the whole yield be forfeited. The crop that you have sown and the yield of the vineyard, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear cloth or wool and linen mixed together. Have you heard this from an atheist before? Right? Oh, you condemn homosexuality, but well, what, what kind of material is in your sweater? Right? Have you heard that before? I remember when I first got saved, and I was just discovering the Bible, and I was evangelizing people that I knew, and the first thing that came up was, you believe that gays aren't God's children, right? You believe that homosexuals can't, and then they begin to just bring up certain things. I thought, well, yeah, the, the Bible says that, and here I am in my infancy of my faith, and the next thing they caught up was, but you can't eat lobster then, right? And you can't wear this and that, and I'm like, let me get back to you on that. I didn't know anything about that. I knew about the homosexuality thing, but I had no idea about, no, let me get back to you. Seriously, that's what it was. Here's a good point. Don't ever be discouraged if you're evangelizing somebody and you don't have the answer right away. Please don't be discouraged. Discouraged. I'll tell you that the, the things that I've learned the most have come from receiving questions and me not having answers for them. Because when you receive that, that's the challenge. You, you, you're faced with a question, somebody asks you something, and it's okay to say, I don't have the answer, but let it drive you to get into the word of God and discover something new. That's how, in the beginning, that's how it was a lot. It doesn't say that. I'm like, does it say that? Can you show me the reference? Because I don't know what you're talking about. And it drove me to my room to get with God and say, Lord, give me clarity of what you're trying to say here. God, are you concerned about how we farm God, are we concerned about how an ox and a dog, what's, God, are you really concerned that my sweater is one material, not two or three? What God is doing here for the Israelites is providing an object lesson. He's trying to preach them in the smallest ways. And the thing that God is trying to preach to his people through these little things, listen, don't sow seeds. Don't put two animals that are contrary to each other together. Don't put two materials and weave them together. Here's the concept that God is promoting, separation to his people. So that when they were making their clothes, guess what they're being preached about? Separation. When they were farming their animals, guess what they were preaching? 
getting preached about? Separation. When they, were, when they were planting seeds, guess what they were being preached about? Separation. That there should be a distinction between two types of things. And because you are my covenant people, there should be a distinction between you and the world. You and the world, there should be a separation. Let's just take two of the three of examples here. What do you think the frustrations would be between having an ox and a donkey yoked together as they were plowing a field? Can, can anybody share some frustrations out of that? One is stronger than the other. The ox is stronger than the donkey. Who's going to be upset out of that pairing? The donkey. And who else is going to be frustrated from that experience? The, the farmer, the owner who has a purpose for these animals to fulfill, and they're not fulfilling it because you have two things with two different natures trying to fulfill the same thing, and it's not working. And so the idea here is don't put two animals with two different natures together, lest it be frustrating for these beasts and ultimately frustrating for the farmer himself. For the farmer himself. And surely this is what Paul the Apostle had in mind. Paul the Apostle had in mind in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look what it says here. Verse 14 and 15. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Where do you think he got that idea from? Where do you think he got that idea from? Deuteronomy 22. The same way you don't put an ox and a donkey together lest the purpose of the farmer is fractured or is hindered or is limited or is frustrated, so you as a believer, you do not yoke yourself with a non-believer because you're heading one way and that non-believer is heading another way. And if you're not heading the same way, there's going to be a lot of frustration on both parts. And we've limited this to marriage. Listen, if there's any standard for who you're finding in a wife or a husband, I hope the first one is that they are born again. I hope, listen, this will save you a lifetime of trouble. It doesn't matter how good she looks, brother. Sister, it doesn't matter how cute the guy is. If the guy is not born again, if the girl is not born again, and you are, as much as you're attracted or lonely now, when you want to get on fire for Jesus later, you are yoked to somebody that is not. And you're going to experience a hindrance and a frustration that the Bible wants to protect you from. Don't compromise on that standard when it comes to yoking yourself to somebody for life. Disaster waiting to happen. And I'm saying this because more and more are people not only yoking with themselves with non-believers. They're yoking themselves with people of other faiths. This is a thing. Because they're getting attention and they're getting affection from somebody who's not a Christian. And here's all these Christians not pursuing me. So I don't want to live lonely. I'm going to go with the Muslim guy. You're inviting disaster into your home. Well, we love each other and we're saying that we're going to have our own convictions. Wait till kids come on the scene. And see who's going to raise up those kids. And how that's going to go. Do not yoke yourself with unbelievers. And help, everybody's like, yeah, I know, I'm going to marry a Christian wife. I'm fine. That's not just talking about marriage. It's talking about friendships. That's talking about any type of relationship. And here's the idea. Listen, you want to grow in God? Yoke yourself to people that want to grow in God. Simple as that. There's your application. That's it. That's it. And I've said this, and we've mentioned this so many times before, so we won't go deep into it. The same concept is with the material of clothing. What is linen used for? If you were to wear something that's made out of linen, what is it used for? Generally to make yourself cool in, in warm weather, right? Cooler at least. What's wool used for? To keep you warmer in cold weather. So here you have two different types of material with two different purposes and they're being woven together. And he says, no, there's the message there. Linen and wool have different purposes. It's a spiritual lesson. Don't mix them together. Because when you bring two things with two different purposes together, you will get frustration. So as the Israelites are doing their laundry, as the Israelites are doing their day-to-day -day work, God is whispering spiritual truths to them. Separation, separation, separation. Holiness, holiness, holiness. 
You're distinct. You're distinct. You're distinct. You're consecrated. You're consecrated. You're consecrated. That's exactly what he's trying to say to each and every one of them, men and women. And that's why we come to verse 12. You shall make yourself tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourselves. That's verse 12, and that's where we're ending. So instead of wearing this type of material and this type of clothing, what you're going to do is you're going to take tassels, tie them to the end of your garment, and you're going to walk around with them. And we go, well, what's the point of that? Is it so that they look different? No, it's because those tassels signify something. Does anybody know as we close what these tassels signify? If you were at Numbers, when we did Bible study Numbers, you would know. Or remember at least. I know it's tough. It's a small detail. But let's try. The tassels, what did they signify? Why were they given for the people to wear? As covenant people. The answer is in chapter 15 of Numbers. And the verse is in 38. Look what it says. This is tied into this verse here. And he's reminding them as he's talking about dress. Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. Why? And to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. Okay, here's the reason. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord. To do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. So again, it's that object lesson. They're going to get lessons from seeds. They're going to get lessons from their beasts. They're going to get lessons from their material. And here's another object lesson. You're going to have these tassels tied to your garment. So that as you're walking and you're kicking that rock down the road, you would see these tassels dangling. And these tassels will remind you of the various commands of God. And by seeing those tassels, you would remember your identity. You would remember who you were made to live for. You would remember who you are. You would remember what you're called to do. And so it was a visual reminder of who God is in their lives and who they are in God. And surely other people that would look at them would say, what are those tassels about? And it would be a witnessing tool. All to say what? What's the spiritual application as we close? Don't mix. Don't be distinct. But if you're going you're gonna to be identified with anyone or with anything, let the word of God clothe your life. Let the truths of who God is cover you. Your word is a lamp unto my what? Feet. Your word guides my feet. Do you think there's a connection maybe there? And so what we, what we see here is that it's, it's the word that governs my steps. It's the word that directs my paths. It's the word that frames my convictions. It's the word. And they would be reminded through these tassels, everything from how I treat a little birdie to how I understand my identity, even biologically. And how I see my brother and sister, all of those things would be reminded. We pumped into their hearts as they would even just look upon it, at least hopefully. Unfortunately, you had the Pharisees later on that were condemned by Jesus for making those fringes extra long to show how religious they were. But it doesn't matter how much you show the world that you have the word on you or in you. That's the Pharisees' condemnation, is it not? Jesus says they love to wear the fringes long so that people can say, oh, look, it's not just the standard. They've gone above the standard. And they display to everybody else how much they knew and how much they revered the word of God supposedly. But inside they were dead man's bones. God never intended this visual reminder to be a display of where I am. See, you can display by how much you know with your mouth and with your arguments. But in the end, what God is after is the display of it in our actions. That's it. Deuteronomy 22. The simple overarching theme. How we do life on a day-to-day -day basis, sure. But how we realize that we're in covenant with one another and we're not doing this life alone. I want to just speak one more thing before we close. Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I don't know what you're struggling with tonight. You could even be struggling with your own sexuality. And it's not just limited to transgenderism. It could be even attracted to the same sex. That could be a genuine struggle that someone in this room has.
you are not outside of the spectrum of God's redemptive power. You are not outside of the possibility of being empowered by God's spirit and changed by his spirit and transformed by his spirit. Listen, church, we can be very strong with our convictions, and I hope we are, but if we're strong on our convictions without offering a hope, we've missed the purpose. And here's the hope. You just heard right things and wrong things. You just heard what God's will is and what man's perverse idea of things should be. But here's the, the true message underneath all of that. No matter where you are today, as confused as you might be, as frustrated as you might be, as difficult as it's been over the years, as secretive as that might be in your heart tonight, God already knows about it. God sees it. I'm not going to pretend to give the answers to the questions that have been burning in your heart to why you and why this and why that. But here is the answer that we all need. That no matter where you find yourself, no matter where your thoughts have taken you, no matter what you've convinced yourself of, no matter how much you thought you would give up, it doesn't matter. There is truth that can set you free tonight. Set you free. What do you mean free? I mean this. That you can live above your desires and your ideas because God would infuse you with his truth in such a way that you desire to serve him more than your own impulses. I'm not saying that there will be clarity in terms of your mind completely with the frustration of why and why and why. But there is a truth that can help you rise above those questions because you understand that no matter what, there's redemption. There's redemption Yes, for my soul, and yes, for my mind, and yes, how I, how I view this world, my worldview can be redeemed. But one day, there will be redemption for my body. That's only possible through the gospel. That's only possible when you embrace Christ. That's only possible when you refuse to do it the way the world does it. And you deny yourself, and you come to him and say, God, I don't, I don't understand it but if you have the answer for this thing overpowering me then I embrace you that I embrace you listen Christians don't bow down to the pressures of this world don't give yourself over to this I know how frustrating it can be even hearing a Bible study like this because you know somebody personally and they are a lovely person and you don't understand the concept of how this person who seems to have talents and gifts and a personality would be under the category of condemned by God and more and more are we seeing Christians embracing this and not even saying that it is something that needs to be changed by God that they can stay the way they are you are doing an injustice not only to God but to that person you're keeping them in that slavery. All for political correctness. Because I'll tell you what modern psychologists are doing even in, especially in the transgender movement. They are steering people as young as possible to make sure that they undergo puberty blockers. Chemical enhancement, whether it's estrogen or testosterone, and ultimately to find a way to make payments for surgical advancement as young as possible. And there are documentaries out there where people who are genuinely confused are sitting in the offices of like supposed experts. And these experts, instead of trying to dig deep into the wounds, into why they're thinking this way about themselves, are pushing them towards, taking it upon their own power to change who they are biologically. It's, a promo it's an agenda. It's an agenda. And so you have certain places around the world that will allow a 15-year-old to go through surgery to change their genitalia. And kids before the age of 10 to pump things into their body to change their voice and change the hair growth and change this and the muscular formation of their body. Listen. The church is doing a disservice to the world by not offering the gospel. People need freedom. People need freedom. And may God give you and I the wisdom to know how to speak to these kinds of people that we know on a personal level. To offer hope and truth and love in the person of Jesus Christ. I speak passionately tonight because the world is speaking very passionately on the other end of the argument. And guess what we don't have? We don't have people offended by that. I mean, we do. 
but you see the offense come when somebody wants to speak biblical truth on it just as passionately. <coughs> Let's pray. God, we ask tonight that not one person here or even on the live stream would feel any hint of condemnation, especially with our particular subjects that we've covered. But we ask that there would be an enlightenment and a hope to realize that if Jesus is who he says he is, and if he is alive as he claims to be, then he can do something with my situation. And we pray that that would be the ringing message in every person's heart tonight. Lord, we pray for the church here, the church around the world, especially in the West, to know how to face this new epidemic. And Lord, we ask for a wisdom from heaven to know how to steer people not into further confusion or frustration, but into greater clarity. Give us wisdom from heaven, Lord, as this is becoming more and more obvious in our day-to-day -day affairs as it's being preached to us by the media and even in our schools, give us the ability to know how to steer people to greater truth. God, we think about not just that subject, but the other things we touched on. If we know anybody that is walking away from truth, give us the love to reach out to them. We can't fully convince them. In the end, that's between them and God. But help us be loving enough to at least reach out. Lord, for the things in our lives that have no distinction, Please give us, please give us an understanding that what this world needs is a sold out believer. A sold out believer. That's what the world is needing. May we be that kind of breed. God, tonight we choose to sing to you passionately because of the wisdom that you've bestowed upon us from a chapter as obscure as Deuteronomy 22. That you have something to teach us even in how we treat little birdies. And you have something to teach us even in the way we build our homes, though that was a different covenant. God, we look to you in thanksgiving that your word is alive and that it speaks to our lives. If anyone in here, Lord, has come and they don't know you, may they know tonight that that can all change by them simply surrendering to you. And understanding that you're the savior, we're the sinners. You have salvation. We cannot attain it. You give it. We receive it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.